and a happy Sabbath to each one of you too. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Father in heaven, we, I ask, Lord, that you would come and be with me. Your Holy Spirit might be here, evidence, in this room today, Lord. Pray that you will touch my mouth and help me to say the words that I have prepared, Lord, and help it to be a blessing to those who listen, I ask in your name. Amen. Well, when Jesus was on earth, he, used, he was teaching his disciples very from the scenes that he saw around about him. There was the shepherd that was on the, on the hills with his sheep. There was the fig tree. There was the grapevine. There's the story of, the, of um, the Good Samaritan that we know so well. Don't always find it easy to carry out the, the wisdom in that story. But Jesus did use simple things. The sower and his seed. And um, from where we live, I have just sort of found a few little um, exercises, you could call it, or interests from looking at the sheep that are around our place. Now, one day last year, I was sitting at our dining room table and I sit purposely with my back to the window because it is so easy to be distracted by the things that are happening in the, the valley. There's always birds or there's ducks or there's something, not too many people, but there's always something there to distract me. And I was quite... Um, absorbed in what I was reading and I th it, was it was very likely the story of redemption or it could well have been just a Sabbath school lesson. And then I heard this noise that penetrated my brain and it just never stopped. And I was a little bit annoyed because I was interested in what I was doing and um, as I say, I didn't want to be disturbed. But this noise continued to persist and it, and it really disturbed me. Then I realised that it was a lamb bleating and obviously it was separated from its mother and it just never stopped. It just went on and on and on. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't. So I'm a bit of a sucker for animals that are in distress and I thought, oh, I suppose I'll have to go and see if I can help it. As I said, I was annoyed because I was interested in what I was reading and um, my husband wasn't around at the time, never is when you need them. So, um, as I said, it was inconvenient. Now, if you would like to turn up to Acts chapter 24 and verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jew Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, it appears as if Paul was in, in prison for about two years and from time to time Felix, who was the governor of the province, came to visit him. And Paul was not frightened at all of telling him about the gospel and um, telling him about the justice of God and the righteousness of Christ. And... Um, Verse 25, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, it wasn't convenient, was it? Felix actually was a cruel man. He, um, had a, uh, he practiced all kinds of cruelty and he knew Paul was innocent of the things that he was, the claims that made about him. <clears throat> but Paul had no fear of him at all and he held up before both Felix and his wife who, as it said, was a Jewish woman and she would have known a lot of the things that the Jewish nation taught. And that one day Felix said, well, go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. Never again was was he to receive another call from God? No, it wasn't convenient, but, you know, when is it convenient to come out to a mission program or a business meeting or a prayer meeting or anything that the church is putting on? 
We all like our comfort zones and I'm as guilty as anybody else. I don't want to come out too much either. But if we're to, to learn about things, if we're to have programs, we have to support these things. So, as I said, it wasn't convenient. And just think about that. That's one of the parallels that I want to talk about, have been talking about, is that it isn't always very convenient. Anyway, getting back to the sheep. So I put on my gum boots and down I trotted to the edge of the property. The lamb was on our side of the property and the mother was on the other. That was going to be obvious. And they were both bleating and carrying on and very distressed. And the mother was too big to get through and the lamb was probably about half grown. And um, so, you know, there was a constant then running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's wire, barbed wire along the bottom of the fence, but the lamb just, just disregarded it, couldn't, couldn't see a way through. <clears throat> My simple, simple mind thought that I would be able to help it, but I couldn't catch the stupid thing and, because that's what I wanted to do, to catch it and push it through the fence. So this lamb had broken the boundaries, was all alone and wanted to get back to the security and safety of its mother. There's another parallel there. I think of the instructions given to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 5 to 8. We can have a look at some of that. And actually in, um, in chapter 6, 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. These were principles that God gave to the children of Israel for the instruction of their children. These are boundaries, aren't they? We have the boundary of the Ten Commandments. We have um, the laws of the land. They are like boundaries. And we have health principles also there for our well-being. And it wasn't very important for the the fathers and the mothers in, in the land of Israel to teach their children. Is it any less important now? In fact, it would be more so, wouldn't it? <clears throat> we teach them so that they may have an upbringing of loving discipline and know where they stand. Well, this lamb again. It kept running back and forth, back and forth, and I was worn out, as it probably was too, because I was trying to chase it into a corner. And then all of a sudden it charged through the fence and was reuni reunited with its mother and everybody was happy, I was too. And all this carry on and I only, I only wanted to help it. But no, it had to do it its way. There's another parallel there, isn't there? We often want to do things our way, not God's way. Many times we may want to help other people. We may want to share the gospel with them. But most don't want to hear and they don't want to accept help. So while all this is going on, I'm thinking, well, there's not another soul around. Couldn't see my neighbours anywhere. I'm not sure I wanted anybody to see me anyway. This old lady rushing back and forth. Anyway, I probably looked pretty silly. But there you see, I was wrong. Our neighbour, Julie, who lives top side of us, must have been looking through her window. And so she realises that I, I'm not having any joy, so she comes out and she's got to walk down the road because, well, it's hard to get over the fences. So she walks down the road and, of course, the lamb has departed. Anyway, she said, can I help you? And I said, well, no, it's all over now. And um, there's another lesson in there too, isn't there? We don't know who's watching us. I mean, I had no idea that she was watching me through, the, through her window because they, they're a distance away and I couldn't see anybody around. If, even if they had been, most people wouldn't have come and given a hand anyway. Oh, well, she's got herself in this pickle. Let her stay that way. So we have to realise that we all have an influence. 
People are watching us. They do notice what sort of lives we live. They do notice what our speech is like. And we have an influence for good or bad. And let it be the influence that we have is a good one and that Jesus accepts it. Now there's another little lesson, the fifth, fifth little lesson. This year one sheep and her twin lambs have been getting through the fence. Just the one mother and her twins just been coming through time after time after time. We didn't worry too much about them because uh, we could shoo them and they would go back. But then when one or two others start to come through, well, that's a bit of a problem. She had figured a way to get through. Now, she's got her coat has, has not been clipped, and so she's got a nice woolly coat on her. And so it's not electric fence. There's barbed wire there along the, the bottom of the fence, but she has just pushed her way through. And pushing her way through, she's left a wad of her wool on the barbed wire. So you see she can just go and come just pushing her way through the fence and it's no problem to her at all. She has actually become conditioned, hasn't she, to the wire. There's a buffer there between her and the wire. And a buffer is said to be anything that softens the blow. Could there be a parallel there for us? We do the wrong thing time after time. We're oftentimes sorry in the first instance but if we continue doing wrong, we become conditioned. And, that's, and that which we felt sorry for initially, is no more concerns us. Some years ago, when we were at Haskell Park, the neighbour next door had sheep in the Haskell Park property, helped to keep the grass down, and they were supposed to be confined by an electric fence. But once again, these animals had... Um, they had woolly coats and the shock from the electric fence really didn't make any difference. Well, one day, one got away. And with one getting away, the whole lot followed. They went down the path, they went out to the road and they were off down the road towards Clevedon. And here's me thinking, oh, what can I do? So I get on my bike and I think I'm after them. Now, what could I do? I don't know. But anyway, I was dead scared that these animals would um, meet a, a car coming this way, you see. So, because there's a dip in the road and everybody speeds along this, this roadway. And um, the animals were just about to go into the dip and here comes this car coming full pelt and slams on his brakes. And what did the sheep do? They just turned in their tracks and they went back the road and they went straight back into the park. Well, they knew where their home was, didn't they? You know, the one thing that I said to the driver, I said, they're not my sheep, which they weren't, of course. So um, we do think that sheep are stupid, but I've been talking to a man who's had a lot to do with sheep, and he says they are very smart, so they can be trained. But um, he said they are very smart. And well, as I said, they knew where their home was, do we contemplate about our heavenly home or are we preoccupied with where we're living now? There are so many other lessons we can learn where sheep were involved when you think of the Bible. There was Abel, who was obedient and brought the right sacrifice. There was Abraham and Isaac. They found provision on Mount Moriah when Abraham's hand was stayed and a ram was caught in the thicket. There was Jacob. Who, had, who was a keeper of many, many flocks, and God blessed his efforts. Then there was Joseph in the early years. He lived with his family, and they had many flocks as well. He was obedient to his father when he was told to go and see what your brothers are up to. Then there was Moses, who went from the king's court to a place of exile and kept watch and guard over Jeth Jethro's flocks. He learned a different mode of control to what he'd been trained for. Then there was David, who was a young shepherd boy called to the king. The flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, were an integral part of the Israelite economy. Mary and Joseph were so poor, they couldn't afford a lamb that brought, and they brought doves for when they had to make a sacrifice. 
Then John the Baptist declared in John 1.29, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Think again about the Passover. Um, in Exodus chapter 12, there was specific instructions about the lamb that was to be sacrificed. It was to be one year old, and it was to be a male without any defect whatsoever. It could be a sheep or it could be a goat, and it was to be killed at twilight. And then the time of the Passover itself, they had to kill the lamb at a certain time. They had to eat it. But there was something more important that they had to do first. Do you know what that was? Any of the children know? That's right. And so they had to be obedient to the instruction God gave them. They were only saved when they were obedient to the Lord's instruction. This exercise pointed forward to Christ's own death and provision he made for each one of us. And many of the Egyptians who were living round about at the time, they knew what was going to happen because they had been warned that the firstborn was going to die that night and they sought refuge with the children of Israel. And the children of Israel happily took them under their wing. <clears throat> Let me read a piece out of Patriots and Prophets. That night must have been a very terrifying night. In awe the people prayed and watched. The heart of the eldest born, from the strong man down to the little child, throbbing with indefinable dread, fathers and mothers clasped in their arms their loved firstborn, as they thought of the fearful stroke that was to fall that night. But no dwelling of Israel was visited by the death-dealing angel, the sign of blood, the sign of a saviour's prote protection, was on their doors, and the destroyer entered not. The shepherd of old times was very, very caring of his, of his charge. He was there constantly to look after his sheep. He knew them all by name, and they would come when he called them. I was thinking about that, and I was wondering... With Abraham, with his so many flocks, how would they have named them all? But then I realised that there must have been so many shepherds and they were probably had, you know, one flock between them so that they, they would know them very well. The shepherd would even give his life for the sheep at times when it, when it seemed to be necessary, if they had to go to a difficult place to collect a lost sheep. They would seek out a lost sheep that was precious to him. And if the sheep was injured, he would carry it back to where the rest of the flock were. He would wrap it in his clothing to keep it warm. Then when he got to a safe and accessible place, he would take the stone or the thorns or the, um, the sticks out of the, out of the lamb's skin or whatever had caused the injury. <coughs> and the shepherd would have had blood and dirt on his clothing. Think about the state of Jesus' clothing after he was scourged. What about the thorns that were plaited to make a crown for his head? Have you ever thought about the person who plaited the crown? He must have been hurt by the thorns. What about the person who pressed the thorns into Jesus' brow? Now. I have some rather lethal looking things here. This is off a lemon tree, and uh, they are long, and they're not nice. And you can get pricked very easily by them. They're very, very sharp, and um, these have not dried out. Um, I made this one time years ago. And they're the best I could do with a crown of thorns to make a crown of thorns. This is actually from a bougainvillea. Now, you have to bend them while they are green because once they are dry, they're brittled and you can't get the shape you want. But just imagine if this had been placed on your head, how would you have felt? 
I read that there are more than a hundred types of thorns that grow in the country in Palestine. They are a fire hazard, but they do serve as a useful fuel. The presence of these thorns and thistles on the ground are there for the curse of God when Adam and Eve sinned. We know it was the soldier's right to have the victim's clothing when the person was crucified. His, the, the robe that Christ had was woven without seam. Have you ever thought, how could you make a garment without a seam? I don't know how you could do that, but maybe someone who's, who's versed in weaving could do that. Have you ever wondered what happened to the soldier whose lot gave him the robe? Did he ever think about the circumstances from whence he got it? It is true that if a sheep is to be slaughtered or shorn, it will not make a sound. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, All as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so Jesus did not open his mouth. Remember when Jesus was in the judgment hall before Herod? Herod plied him with many, many questions, but Jesus had nothing to say. Pilate was also amazed that Jesus did not answer his accusers. Well, we know the continuing story. On that Good Friday, the precise moment Jesus died, the lamb in the temple that was being sacrificed escaped. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom by an unseen hand and the Holy of Holies was exposed. Surely the darkness at that time of day and the earthquake earthquake that they felt would have brought fear and wonder to the people. For the priests, the uncovering of the most holy place, it filled them with the dread of a coming calamity. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Christ. Now, it would not have been that easy to get it down. Maybe they had some helpers, but if, as you remember, the cross was lifted up high and so they would have had to have perhaps a ladder of some kind to help them get the body down. So who took the crown of thorns out of Christ's head? And who washed the bloodstains off his body? What would you have done if you had been there? It's quite a solemn thought, isn't it? When they cleaned the bloodstains off him, then they wrapped him in a clean linen sheep and eventually put him in Joseph's new tomb. Near the end of time, the parable of the sheep and the goats will become a reality. Sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. But it won't be sheep and goats that it will be people divided as to those saved and those not saved. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And then I read, yet it was a struggle, even for the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. Desire of Ages, verse 739, is something that everybody will see. When Christ shall come to the earth again, not as a prisoner surrounded by a rabble, will men see him. They will see him then as the heaven's king. Christ will come in his own glory, in the glory of his father, in the glory of the holy angels. Ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands of angels, the beautiful and triumphant sons of God, possessing surpassing loveliness and glory, will escort him on his way. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Then every eye shall see him, and they also that pierced him. In the place of a crown of thorns, he will wear a crown of glory, a crown within a crown. In place of that old purple kingly robe, he will be clothed in raiment of whitest white so as no fuller on earth could wipe them. 
The question is, will you and I be on the right-hand side or on the left? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should, have, should not perish but have everlasting life. And that is something for us to think about today. The Lamb of God, that innocent little Lamb, and then Christ became the Lamb, for us. So let's sing our last hymn. Help us to remember, Lord, the provision that you have made for us, and help us to be obedient to you, to your requirements. Help the parents to set the boundaries in the home for their children, and lead us in our lives as the shepherd does his sheep, and help us to accept the sacrifice of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, and our sin, and my sin. Amen.